Well, good to see everybody again uh, today. Welcome back, everybody. Um, just, I, I'm not sure if we've got people that weren't with us last week, but if you weren't with us last week, then um, hello to you. Thanks for joining us this week. And um, just very quickly, um, Sharon and I both work for Thursa Grows, and um, we've been there um, in the last couple of years with a CCF-funded project, very, uh, very similar to yourselves, of course, um, at Laird Learning and interested in the sort of local and seasonal growing and zero waste on our foods and zero miles on our foods and things like that. So very much um, in line um, with what you guys are doing. So just to let you know a little bit about ourselves and, and our background as well. So um, what I'll do is just very quickly run you through what we're going to do um, this week. Um, so we're going to have a little bit look at tools in a minute. Um, so Sharon and I um, have got some tools that we'd like to share with you, things that we think are quite useful um, in your journey to, to help you get up and going. And then um, we're going to have a little bit of a interactive session. Are we st you still want to go ahead with a breakout, Sharon? I do. Yeah. I'm going to try fine. something radical today, everybody. Yep, yep. <laughs> um, so basically a little bit on that and then we'll have a wee breakout. Um, and then um, we're going to look at some seed sizes. And we tried this with our own group last week and it didn't work terribly well. We did have a little video set up, um, which is a video of me sowing some seeds in a tray. And although you could see the pictures, you couldn't actually hear the video at all. So what I'm going to do is I've just got a tray here. We're going to use our imaginations that I've got some compost and I'll run you through how you would actually go. Um, go about sowing some seeds in a tree. So we'll have a wee look at that as well. Sharon and I have got some links and resources, as Sharon said, to share with you this week too. Um, a little on companion planting coming up as well. So things that you can plant alongside um, to help. Am I still here? Because it keeps coming up with connection is unstable. <laughs> you're, it's it's um, just, um, it's, it's middling stable, Jill, but you're okay. I'll, okay. I'll catch you. I'll let you know. Yeah. Um, for those of you that weren't here earlier, I've had a, a power cut this morning as well, so I'm having a wee bit of problems with connection issues this morning. So, so let's get up and running then. Um, <laughs> and she's frozen on us. <laughs> oh, you're back. <laughs> this is my first one. I'm back. Oh, <laughs> I was away and I didn't even know it. My first one. This oh, is my tool. first She's one. Okay. <gasps> That's not okay, Jill. That's my first one. <laughs> These like tools. are We're talking called, about tools. These are called Korean hose. Okay. Now I have um, a right-handed one. Sharon has a left-handed one. So these tools are available for both hands <laughs> if you're really clever you could get to <laughs> but these are absolutely brilliant um i use this quite a lot as it just helps you i use the point of it quite a lot actually to be more honest because it can reach into wee bits and pieces at the back of a bed where you're not quite tall enough or long enough to reach in but you can use this right in the back of the bed for weeding and just picking out individual weeds and you can use it this way as a sort of slice through weeds as well. Um, so, and they're very quick. It just reduces your time um, quite considerably on the weeding front. I'm going to jump in because I don't know about everyone else, Jill, but you sort of froze as you were introducing that segment. But basically, we're just going to go over a couple of tools and techniques or things that we absolutely love and have found invaluable in our experience. So, and, and Jill rather annoyingly has picked the Korean hoe, which is my favourite tool. So. <laughs> <laughs> but that that is a, a, a multi-purpose tool <laughs> um and it's about 20 quid if you get a good quality one i've just put a link up for a bergen and ball who do either left or right-handed ones um someone reliably informed me that they got one for three quid out of the factory shop which they said they know it's not going to be as good still and they know it might not last very long but she's going to get her training wheels on with that one today so cheaper versions are available um my suggestion is have less tools and buy quality things. And that's that's a learned experience. But if you're just starting off and, and, and want to try, yeah, go for that three quid one because she's quite right. She doesn't know if she'll love it or hate it. 
Um, there is a link in the chat for a web browser. And Jill and I get quite excited about these, don't we, Jill? Revolutionised our gardening. We do. <laughs> they do. <laughs> so much faster. So much faster. So, um, that, so that's my first one. Um, my second one... Um, hold on. I've got so much stuff on my desk this week. This is my, my second one. Okay, so if I... Can everybody see that okay? Yep. There we go. So this is my second one. Um, this was, yeah. Particularly for me, seeing as I'm a bit older than Sharon, um, I forget things. So I wanted to record what I'd been putting in my garden. And especially, um, as I told you last week, I started out very much as a beginner. Okay, so as a beginner, I found it very useful for me to write things down. And that's what I've been um, continuing to do ever since. The reason why I particularly like this one is it's a five year book. Now it is a little bit more expensive. Um, but again, as Sharon was saying, you don't have to get that. You could just get a little exercise book out of Tesco's for a pound and just write in what you want to write in. Um, but just to show you this one, um, for example, there's uh, May from last year. Okay, so we have a column here for the weather. Okay, there is one here for plants in your garden in bloom. There is one here for tasks and one here for notes. So you can write in, for example, the 1st of May last year, weather warm, sunny, overnight, very little wind, five to nine miles an hour, very dry, no rain. Sunrise 517, sunset. 2109 okay and then other things i've got at the back is a list of um, any fruit bushes and plants and things that i've bought and put into my garden because i would forget so this is my number two item i think um particularly for beginners having somewhere to write down and record what worked, what didn't work what cultivar you were using and what vegetable you grew that you liked or you didn't like the flavor of it um, that has really really helped me and it's great just to be able to go back and check what you did the previous year and check when things came out in your garden so that's that's my second one Sharon do you want to go with your second yeah I just I put a link up um in the chat um and again the girls at leg learning center have got these links but Jill got that one for a birthday present it's 15 quid and it's a five-year planner but we've also we've had a look for a slightly cheaper option um which is 673 which we'd recommend also it's got good information capture on it um and the cheapest option yeah is just get a bit of paper and make some notes yeah. um and I cannot cannot um I'm only just learning these things myself Jill <laughs> do you know what I mean but when you put a, an apple tree anything I'll never forget what type of apple tree that was and three years later I'm scratching my head thinking what apple tree was that again just <laughs> I've got to start thinking about pruning it. So, so honestly, like, if, if do something differently from what I did, <laughs> be better. Uh, all right, my next one: tools and techniques. So, this is something I get really super duper excited about. It's reuse, reduce, recycle. Gardening is not does not have to be an expensive hobby. So, when it comes to planting out your seeds and your plants, you can reuse things from around your house. Um, these sorts of little pots, if you. Or anything of similar thing. If you if you have something like that, that is an absolutely fantastic size for starting off seeds in. Put holes in the bottom so you get some drainage. But something that size, I could start off absolutely loads tomatoes, cucumbers, um, cucubets, all sorts of things like that. You could even like when you when you transplant your salads on, and we'll talk a bit about sowing salads later. And you, if you want to grow them on a bit before you put them out, you could plant them into things like that. But just always make sure you put holes in them. Things like that. You know, honestly, anything around the house, you can find lots of things around the house, put holes in them, but I could make a little row of seedlings and grow them on quite happily. You do not have to go out if you're just starting on gardening and buy lots and lots of expensive things. Um, better to ask like, this one I've just learnt this year, so I got really excited about Jill. <laughs> right, it's a toilet paper. <laughs> and you see all these people say, oh yeah, you can plant your seeds in this. And why is it so clever? Because you don't have to actually take the plant out when you put it on and doing that disturbs the roots and disturbing roots of young seedlings sets them back um you can put them into toilet paper but what i've been doing she says 10 years in is i've always just put the soil in and sort of stood them up and not being very clever about it and then this year i saw a little youtube video where you 
you, you make it into a square, right? You sort of see all right, John. Yep, I can. It's like being Peter, isn't it? But I'm so excited when I learned this. And then you turn it around and you've actually got the pot. And then you can stand that pot up and someone sent a picture of them standing up in like quality street box. So they were all sort of stood up and supported. And then when you go to plant that out, honestly, it will increase your plants. The, the stress that your plant will experience from transplanting it into its final place will be so much less because you don't have to actually take it out of that pot. You plant that whole pot in the ground and the pot will biodegrade around it. I mean, if you can't buy that for money, it's really, really good. So I'd really recommend that. So simple. <laughs> um, your go, Jill. Okay, back to me. Okay, so on a similar theme of not needing things that are terribly expensive, um, I've also got a plastic bag here. So this is like a sandwich bag. Um, so if you um, make up sandwiches and take them to your work, if you're not furloughed of things at the moment, then um, this actually makes a brilliant little propagator for your plants and for seedlings. So if you have seedlings, for example, that um, need a slightly warmer climate to germinate in, you can pop it over the top um, of your pot and just basically create, tie a rubber band around it and just create a little mini propagator for it. Um, and you'll get a temperature zone which is higher for around the top zone of the plant. If you have a plant which prefers a little bottom heat, um, and personally, who doesn't like a little bit of bottom heat? Um, I pop it on the, on the base like so. And again, you can just put a rubber band or something around it. Stop giggling, Sharon. <laughs> everybody likes a warm bottom and uh, <laughs> if you've got a, a plant for example that is not quite so fast likes a cooler top around the leaf zone it prefers a warmer zone around the root zone then this is just a nice cheap way of doing it without actually having to buy a propagator propagators are brilliant i bought myself a little propagator um, with one of my first wage packets from Thurzo Grows. So I love my wee propagator to bits, but they, they are quite expensive. Um, and just to get started, you just need a wee plastic bag and that's a brilliant, brilliant little propagator for you to use. Okay. Yeah, so plants, some plants particularly like um, a warm start, 21 degrees and above to get started. So that's things like your tomato plants, your courgette plants, your squashes. Um, don't, 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 don't go starting them too, too early, because um, although, gosh, I just really want to get grown at the moment, and I know Jill's already started, <laughs> <laughs> but they, they need heat to get them going. They're hot plants that would get grow best grown on in um, greenhouses, conservatory, polytunnels, um, and those plants will be the ones that will really benefit from that, that little mini propagator that Jillbo is showing us there. Um, someone has said, Jill, I'm just interrupting the chat, someone is using, this is genius, an advent calendar. Yes, I saw that. I think it was Colette used, used the inside of an advent calendar. Brilliant. For so on. Yeah. Absolutely great. Brilliant. Yeah. Um, Be if, creative with it. Yeah. Um, make sure there's holes in the bottom and it, it won't have a massive amount of depth. Um, so they'll probably need to go on quite soon, but it's great to get started off with. So great. Razor yes, hoe, yes, Paula. Yeah, sorry. I call it a Korean hoe. <laughs> so me and Jill can do this. <laughs> right. We're gonna what we're gonna do is something quite radical. We're gonna move you into we haven't done this before, but we're gonna try it. We're gonna move you into breakout rooms. Zoom's got this many of you will know this more than I do. It's one whole function where I can split you off into little groups. There's there'll be small groups, and I think I'm gonna put three to four of you in a room at a time. You're gonna be in that room for about five minutes, give or take, and I would ask you, you'll be in a small group, to take yourselves off mute and have a chat to each other. So bear in mind, you've got about a minute per person to have a chat. Just get in and go for it. Introduce yourself. Um, perhaps say your name, whereabouts you are. <laughs> um, and if you've got a favourite tool, like let's learn from each other. I know that some of you are already gardening. So if you've already got a favourite tool and if you haven't, maybe, and if you're just getting started, maybe say what your favourite plant or food is that you're looking forward to growing. So we just believe that there's probably a lot of learning already in the group. Oh, Caroline, just stay with us then. If it tries to put, or, or go in and observe. Yeah, if you can't, if you find that you get stuck, 
don't stress it will just be five minutes of the whole session so just go and observe listen to other people it's also interesting and you can have a chat going in the room as well so you can also say that because i can see someone here hasn't got a microphone Caroline, can you mime <laughs> No. <laughs> Sorry, just ignore me. Shut up now. Jill, Jill's probably woke up at five o'clock this morning. <laughs> right then. So it should automatically pop you in your great breakout room. It should automatically bring you back again. If you get stuck, please do not worry. Just stay with us. You can talk to me and Jill. Okay. Um, and... Bear with me. And that should be people automatically going through. Jill, you might get put in a breakout room yourself. Yeah, it's asking me to go to breakout room three, but I'm just going to say no. Okay. Unless you want me to go in, but um, I'll just say not now. Okay. I think we've still got a few people here, which is fine. If you find that you haven't managed to get into a breakout room, just stay with us. We'll have a chat here. Um, welcome to unmute yourself. We've got Anne. Right, Jill, I'm going to leave you here with Anne and Linda, perhaps. I'm going to go and join one of the breakout rooms. All right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Are you there, Anne and Linda? Hello. Hello. Hello, I'm on my Hello. mobile. I'm, I'm absolutely struggling with it just now. I'm not on my laptop, so oh dear, I can't do the chat. And I can't do the audio. I'm actually not in my house just now, so it's oh. fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, well done for persevering. This technology <laughs> game's not fun sometimes, is it? <laughs> it's not ideal on your mobile, that's for sure. <laughs> no, never mind. Never so mind. I don't have a favourite tool, but I'm definitely going to get one of those hoes. That looks quite interesting. Yes. Um, uh, Sharon actually got them for our community garden uh -huh. um, up in Thurso. And I didn't buy mine till after that because I had a wee shot of them at the community gardens. And I thought, my mm. God, there's just the amount of time it reduces when you're, when you're weeding. Um, so I always tend to do my weeding on quite a hot day and I'll pull this through. You can do it really, really quickly. And of course it cuts right. the roots of the weed just like that. And then yeah. I just, I leave them on the top of the surface and when it's a hot day, they just dry up and die. Yeah, anyway. and Good oh, idea. It's so much faster. It really is. Anything to save time, that's for sure. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. It makes, makes quite a big difference. So, yeah. So what about a favorite plant? Do you have any favorite plants instead? Uh, vegetable wise um, just anything that grows basically <laughs> <laughs> we got an allotment last year so it's, it's very much trial and error just now um, Right. quite a lot of things have not been very successful but after the chat last week I realised that some of the seeds might have been old so I think that's why uh, we haven't germinated but um, yeah. what was successful um, potatoes, carrots Mm -hmm. Fruit, black currants well, with an abundance of them but the soil is quite sandy so obviously carrots and things will be quite happy there um, carrots are like that yep. yeah the brassicas all oh, got every beast known to man I got um, oh dear. the root fly I had the white butterfly So, the, but I didn't mm -hmm. net them but this year I'll net them yeah. I'll try again you've really really got to yeah yeah. I I have realised that. So this should again, <laughs> what I've done, what I was going to ask you was, how do I get the soil more fertile? Because this was like virgin ground that we dug over. Um, so we've put seaweed on it, obviously putting a bit of compost in, but anything else I should be using to make it fertile? Do you have a, um, the ability on your plot to, to make your own compost? Yes, but that's quite a slow, it seems to be quite a slow process. 
It is a wee bit. It can be a bit okay. of a slow process. Um, and it, it's based on how much material you can actually get into it as well. If you get more material and your compost bays are about a meter cubed, then you'll find it will uh-huh. break down a lot quicker. If you've got smaller compost bays or the Dalek style bins, then they, they uh-huh. tend to be a little bit slower because um, oh, it's yeah. the bulk in the material that creates the heat. And then once you've uh-huh. got the heat, that's what speeds it up. Um, but I mean, up, up where we are, Sorry, on you go. It's quite open. It's just like um, kind of old pallets we've put together to make the compost. That's okay, bin. though. Aye, so... That's okay because oxygen's important as well. They must have oh, oxygen. Okay. It's 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 what's called an aerobic process, so right, it must okay. have oxygen as well. Wow. Yeah, that's fine. Because somebody I know has got a hot box, and they seem to be getting really quick compost. So I wasn't very sure yeah. they were doing it correctly. Yeah, I mean, the, the hot boxes are brilliant, but some of them, mm-hmm. I, I don't think there's um, one cheaper than £600. I think the basic models are about at least five or £600. Oh, I wouldn't bother then. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, yeah, it's really easy when you've got a hot composter. That's really easy. <laughs> it's not quite so easy when you're doing it um, for real. Uh, yeah. yeah. Where about are you, Anne? Dornach. Oh, you're Dornach, right. Aye, so you're not I'm too Dornach. far away. Right. No, not at all. Not at all. So we've no, got the same no, thing okay. and everything. Oops. Right. Okay. We've got lots of lots of faces back in the room again. Me too. Good. Are we all back out of the breakout zones then? Yeah. How did you get on? That was good. Yeah, yeah. It's nice well, to have a wee chat, isn't it? When we've all <laughs> been socially locked down, it's like, oh my god, people. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah. oh, sorry, I'm popping people on mute by accident. Sorry. You're very good at this, Sharon. Very techie. <laughs> oh. I don't know. <laughs> Tell I, me I that had... in four weeks when we get to the end. <laughs> well, I had I had to do a Zoom meeting yesterday, and they they struggled with all this uh, breakout rooms, but you've done amazing. You know, I've I've never done a breakout room before. I'll tell you what, that was a YouTube video and a bit of <laughs> studying. <laughs> well done, well done. Oh, yeah. oh well, well done, everybody. For thank you so much for embracing the new, the new norm. <laughs> Hopefully, for not too much longer. Oh yeah, just get me back in my garden, right, Jill? Right, Jill. We've, so, been, we've talked too much, Jill. You know what? It's twelve twenty-five. No pressure. Yeah. <laughs> <We're>, <laughs> Okay, I'll okay. zoom through this. Zoom. <laughs> zoom. Right, keep me right on time, my dear. Yeah. Okay, all I wanted to do, um, Sharon, can you just share my screen very quickly for a moment, please? Uh, I think you are you are able to share. Oh, am I? Oh, 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 right, okay. You will notice, everybody, that I am not as proficient at this as Sharon is. <laughs> and share. Okay, let's see what we get. Let me know. That's working. Yes. Right. No. So, well, hold on, hold on, hold on. Um, <laughs> if I, how's that? Can you all see the structure of the seed? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. I move that across a little bit and put that. Oh, geez, how do I make that smaller again? There it is. It's Sorry. working. No, That's right. it. Okay. Right. Very quickly. Um, I just wanted to show you this. Please do not be put off by by all the, the slightly bigger words here. If you know them, brilliant. If you don't know them, doesn't matter. What we've got here: external experience uh, appearance. Sorry, of the seed. So, um, what this is is actually a broad bean seed. So, all seeds have got a lovely tough outer coating, um, and contained within it is basically a baby plant. Everything that the plant needs to grow. So we have up the top of the seed here what's called the position of the radical. The radical is just the root, okay? So that's all you need to remember from that. The outer coating is known as the testa or the seed coat, which is much easier. And then the other thing which is important is there's a tiny, tiny little hole there called the micropile. And that is crucial because that's what allows the water into the seed to allow it to start swelling, to break down all the enzymes and the food resources that are in there for the seed to actually grow. Okay, if we move along, we've got this one under C here, one cotyledon removed. What that all that means is that cotyledons are the seed leaves. Okay, so when the first of the, the little leaves come through and poke their heads out at you, 
um, you get cotyledons and those are the seed leaves. At the top here is your little baby plant with the true leaves. That's the actual leaves that you would recognize off the plant. And then your baby root there again. And then if we just go directly below it, we've got this split here. And that basically just shows you a 3D version of your plant. There's your true leaves there tucked away inside, protected by the outer seed leaves. So that's the bit that protects it as it's being pulled up through the ground. You've got your little stem, your baby stem and your baby root. And that is basically your embryo plant. And if I can just zoom that one down, there's a fantastic picture of it. There's a broad bean there. There's your true leaves. And there's the resources, the little food pack and everything that it has there. Okay, so just to show you. Right, Sharon, bring me back. What do I do? <laughs> Stop You're sharing, back. that's it. Yeah, there you go. Well done. That's it. Okay, so very quickly, just to carry on from that, 1229. <laughs> There's a um, squash seed, so you can see that's quite a big seed. Um, just coming down a size, this is quite difficult. There's a melon seed. Okay, so again, just reducing in size. And then these ones are basil. I'm not even sure if you're going to be able to see them. Okay, absolutely minuscule, and you get smaller ones again. The biggest seed in the world is from the palm tree. Coco de Mer, it's called, Seed of the Sea. And, and it's about the size of a football and has a very, very tough outer coating. So moving swiftly on, how do we go to sow seeds? So just use your imaginations here a little bit. Just pretend I've got a load of compost on my desk here in front. I'm moving my laptop. I'm hoping I'm not about to die on you all. Okay, so we've got our little seed tray here. Just imagine I've got a nice big pile of compost right next to me here. So this is seed compost. What I've done with it is I've broken it up with my hands and I've broken it up to get air through it. And I've also broken it up to remove any large clumps of material that I don't want in there. Okay, so we would break all of that up. We would then pick it up and load it into our seed tray. We would deliberately overfill the seed tray. So as you're putting your compost in, Give your seed tray a tamp down on your work surface and deliberately overfill it so that the compost is coming out over the top and the edges. Okay, then once you've done that, either get yourself a ruler or a straight edge, a piece of wood, something like that would do it. Start in the middle of your tray and you would saw a sawing action one way to remove the excess compost and then saw with the sawing action the other way to remove your excess compost place it down, give it a tamp down, what's called tamping. What I use, and what Sharon showed me, which was a brilliant little technique, is another seed tray on the top and just push it down gently on the top. And that's just to give your seed tray compost a little bit of consolidation. So you've got air through it, but you're just pushing it down gently because the baby roots like and need a nice firm substrate to get the roots into. So a little bit of gentle consolidation. You're not pushing down all the way to um, Australia, but just a little bit of gentle consolidation just to give them a nice firm base. What I would then do at that point is I would pop it into another seed tray with water in it, obviously one that doesn't have holes in the bottom, and just allow it to soak up the water for about an hour, take it out, let it drain, and then that's then ready for you to sow your seeds. Now, as we said last week, one of the common things that, that people do is they tend to over sow a little bit. So I would then just make three little small indentations, three little drills, what's called a seed drill, which is just a little line. Now you can either do that gently with your finger or if you've got a shorter ruler, this one's a bit long, you could just push it down into your surface and just give it a wee wiggle and you'll create a nice little seed drill in, the, in your tree. And from there, just take your seeds, pop them into your hand first of all, pick a couple up, particularly if they're really small ones like I showed you there on the basil, and then just gently drip feed them into your little seed tree, into your little drill. Once you've done that, all I do is a kind of pinching action with my fingers. So again, if we just use our imagination, we would have our compost here, we'd have our seeds in our seed drill, and I would just be gently pinching 
the compost over the top. Okay, and then that way your tray's already watered and your seeds are in and you've covered them and they're good to go. The most important tip I can give you for seed sowing is read what it says in the instructions on the back of your packets because they will give you, hopefully I'm not losing connection here, they will give you the correct information as to what depth your seed needs to be at and also as to what conditions it needs. So if you think back to that picture I've just shown you there of the seed with its casing, some of those casings in order to break down, they need a period of cold. Some of those casings you need to scratch and rub them first to get it to open a little bit, to allow it, because they're so good at protecting the baby plant inside. Some of those cases need light to help them break down. Some of those cases need darkness to help them break down. So it will tell you, cover the seeds with a light layer of compost or vermiculite is the other thing that you see sometimes. Um, you don't need to use vermiculite, just cover it with a very, very light layer of compost. Um, so read the instructions because they're the most valuable bit of information that what that seed needs to enable the seed coat to break down and then allow your little seed to then germinate. Okay, so hopefully, um, hopefully that all makes sense. All right. There you go, Sharon. I'm one minute under. Might get cracking. You're an absolute winner. Um, I'm going to ask you two quick questions. We've got 30 seconds for each answer. Okay. Um, Jill, do you have to plant your seeds the right way up or can you just plump them in? And the other question is what's the difference between potting compost and seed compost? Um, Right, potting compost and seed compost. Let's start with that first of all. Seed compost is usually very poor in nutrients deliberately because again, if you think of that little seed under the soil, I mentioned enzymes and I mentioned um, the food resource, the food store, what's called the endosperm. That's where that little plant gets all its energy from to start growing. You've also got very, very small baby roots. If you put them into really strong nutritional type fertile compost you are going to burn the little baby roots it's way too much for them so seed compost is deliberately designed around the needs of a young baby plant and that means seedlings the other thing about seed compost is it is normally sterile to help reduce um, any diseases and bacteria which could be present um, in normal garden compost for example so try to use a peat-free sterile seed compost, something like fertile fibre. It's the one that um, Sharon found for us in the community gardens and it's absolutely brilliant. I love this stuff. I could sit and play with my hands in it all day. It's great stuff. Okay, so the other thing, um, Sorry, Jill, potting compost you again is... What did you call fertile fibre. Fertile fibre, thank you. Fertile fibre. Sharon will have a link some. She's the link queen. Okay, so um, the other thing is potting compost then very quickly is um, slightly more nutrients, but potting compost tends to be very, very free draining. And by that, it just means when you put the water in, it disappears quite quickly. Potting compost, again, can be used for cuttings. It's the same thing. And that just means that when you're trying to get something to establish roots having taken a cutting, they're not rotting because the substrate that they're in is too wet. I hope that I hope that makes sense. It is important try and put your seeds in the right way round. Um, again, just try and think about the orientation, what way round that little seed is. It's not always easy to tell. Some seeds want to be placed on their sides. If you do put them in upside down by mistake, and we've all done it, it's not it's no big problem. Um, plants are very, very good at what's called polarization, which is actually turning themselves round the right way. So it'll go down to start with. That little um, plumial bit, the bit with the baby leaves on it, will realise it's going the wrong way and gravity and sunlight will help turn it and pull it up. So most of the time, as long as they're not planted too deep, they will actually correct themselves. The roots are designed to go down, the stem is designed to go up. So most of the time, the plant will correct itself. Okay, does that make sense? All happy? Good. <laughs> 
I'm a bit of a plonker myself. <laughs> Still to this day, just plonk them in and wish them luck. <laughs> so, so don't get too caught up in things, <laughs> would be my advice. Um, no, Fertile Fiber, we get ours online, um, Susan, but um, I would also really advocate going to your local garden centre and just encouraging them to get in a peak free organic compost if that is how you're inclined to grow that is how I'm inclined to grow um, and the more that they can get in I mean at the level at which most of us will be off which is just starting you know for fertile fibre something for Jill and I who just get excited about growing about 6,000 plants in the spring and we're, we're a little bit possibly too much into our subject <laughs> so, so so um um uh, any sort of lovely you know don't let these details break you grow things want to grow yeah. just go for it and if you can support a local supplier even better and if all you've got is multi-purpose compost then just use multi-purpose compost yeah so don't get too hung up on it um i'd just like to um signpost you guys to the fact that um Verso community development trust which is the trust that jill and i work for up in verso Go figure. What it says my tears. Young Jill spent a lot of lockdown um, doing lots of videos. So if you go onto Thurso Community Development Trust website, she's got a couple of different playlists. One of them is her Go Get Gardening videos, which has got 26 different videos on. And this is where Jill, I mean, you can really, you can get really excited with Jill about all the different things. Um, potatoes, tomatoes, mulching, beginning, sowing seeds, things like that. She's actually got a two hour, a four part, two hour <laughs> session on how to sow seeds. <laughs> So if you've got a lot of time on your hands, the you're government's really bored. you indoors and you're never allowed out again. <laughs> if you have a look at the playlists on our channel on Thursday Community Development Trust, you will find a sowing seeds session. Oh, if anybody's a... having trouble sleeping at night, then I recommend the How to Sow Seeds workshop. <laughs> But they are excellent. And if you're starting out, you know, there's a lot of information on there. So we're just, you know, I mean, we are plugging ourselves, but we're just also about, you know, signposting you to good things online. Right. I'm also um, going to go into a quick PowerPoint. It's 1240. I'm mindful of time. I'm going to try to do this one fairly quickly. Um, oh, I just managed to add a... Jill, can you see what I'm um, doing here? I've got, I've got a bit of a mix between um, the Thursday Grows channels and your PowerPoint at the moment. All right, I'll just I'm going to go into it like this and see if that works. There was a few things. See that one? That's it. There's a few questions about um, companion planting, and I get really, really excited about companion planting. And so I did a very short slideshow just to show you guys some of the benefits of companion planting. What is companion planting? Uh, essentially, it's the planting of several crop species together um, and they support each other, as would happen in nature. There is no such thing as a monoculture in nature. Nature is diverse and multi layered and structured, and different plants in different systems support each other to create different built yields and benefits. Um, companion planting or the gardening that I would encourage you to grow and that's been most successful for me is to try to mimic nature as much as possible, observe her patterns. That's what companion plant. Let's plant two or more crops together that give each other benefit. So there's some basics. When you plant two or more crops together, they might help improve the flavor or health of a different plant. Um, so what's an example of that? Something like basil and peppers, which you might grow in your greenhouse, your polytunnel or your conservatory. Um, it's said that by planting basil with your peppers, the basil actually helps to improve the flavour of the peppers. But they're also, and this is the same with tomatoes, they also do a very important job because it's quite a pungent herb to repel things like aphids and spider mites, which are both pests that can cause a lot of damage to your plants in the young stages. So they are companion plants that benefit each other as they grow. Uh, it's good to know about companion planting that you do need a wee bit of knowledge. Oh, my PowerPoint just goes off on its own tangent, but uh, there's lots of things you can look up online and I'll just sign point you to some easy pictures at the end. But if you go into Google and you do a quick Google search and you put in Google images, companion planting chart, those three words together, 
you bring up lots of different pictures and charts and some of them are really simple, but different plants have different relationships and there's lots of research and people's experience done. So just do a wee bit of research before you start popping things together. Um, one thing is um, you have to be slightly careful because some things might interfere with other things. So an example I found is like parsley. Parsley, when you put it in, it's like a tiny little, you know, tiny bit of parsley that actually grows into quite a big abundant bushy plant. If you put that with things like lettuces, they can outcompete the lettuce. So there's lots of things that you can plant with lettuce that create a favorable relationship. There's a picture just on the right, but you can see things like chives and marigolds. So the marigolds are great again, because they um, attract aphid eating ladybugs. Ladybugs are one of your beneficial gardeners. It's great to have a garden full of ladybugs. They'll be eating your aphids. So the more ladybugs you have, the better. And they're attracted by marigolds and things like chives or garlic are very strong and pungent and they repel those, um, those aphids. So they're fantastic plants that benefit each other. Um, other things that you might consider is about, can you guys hear that drum roll? No, it, it didn't come up this time. <laughs> This, this slideshow's got one there's a drum roll on mind. <laughs> things like um, plant things like mint next to your salads. Um, contain mint. Mint can get quite wild. It's a big bulky bully of a plant and it can go wild and overtake your beds. But it can also be used as a sacrificial plant. So things like slugs can eat your mint before they get to your nice juicy salads. So there's some really clever things that you can do to provide a garden that is dynamic and doing a lot of the work for you by using companion planting. And you can use your space more productively. So you don't just have this one plane on which you're gardening, you're also gardening on verticals and horizontals. So a good example of this, which is we probably won't do in the north of Scotland, you could try down in Kent, <laughs> it's the three Cambridge. sisters and Cambridge and you let us know, <laughs> we won't like you very much. Um, is your... <laughs> The three sisters it's, it's a classic companion planting but it's a brilliant example you've got um vertical growing so you've got your your corn your sweet corn which is that long sort of structural plant in the middle you plant your beans around underneath it the beans are brilliant they're a nitrogen fixer which means they're benefiting the soil for the next plant but they're using the structure of the beans to grow up and then right at the bottom you plant your squash none of them are competing for height or light because they're all at different stages but the squash provides, as it grows, they get absolutely huge and provide a sort of cover for the soil, which keeps the soil nice and more um, moist and out of the sun. So it's creating shade. So it means that you're protecting your soil, you're adding nutrients and you're providing structure. And you've got three different plants growing in a space that you might traditionally only plant one. So there's some real benefits. What's next? Oh, I like that. If you see that poster when you do your Google image, that's a brilliant poster as a starter. You know, you can print it out or get it online or you can buy it. Um, but yeah, it just shows what plants go quite well together in good companions and what some don't help each other. So, so an example of that is don't plant your cucumber and your potatoes together. It's saying it's not a good companion, it's a bad companion because they both share a disease um, that is blight. Um, so both families of, of crops can share that disease and the last thing you want is, is your two plants doing that. There's a, I like that picture on the left. That for me is a great example of someone doing small scale sort of backyard or allotment planting where they've got um, intercropping. So they've got rows of crops. I mean, you, 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 you want to create ease when you come to harvesting. You don't want to have to walk 50 paces between the jungle <laughs> to crop your salad. You know, they've got a small amount of crops together, but they're using their borders. They've got beautiful plants in the borders that are creating attracting beneficial insects they're interplanting so things like the onions are next to the carrots there and you can see that the onions help propel the, the carrot fly oh, no, losing. but yeah I think a, and then they've got brassica so they've got it's a lovely example of having sort of a mixed cropping system yeah, this is my garden <laughs> and i'm just showing you you can do that across your raised beds as well so like on the right i had some beans on the right of my raised beds and i had onions and you can see most of my beds at home i plant on the edges um i've got things like calendula i've got things like borage which are attracting bees i've got things like lavender i've got lots of nice strong pungent herbs and things like that and interplanting so it can be as simple as having smaller beds but you're planting at the edges to increase your beneficial wildlife um, and that one of my polyton my hand raised and saved at the starlings but you can see my polyton is like a jungle it's utter chaos but this is a designed jungle 
you know, each of those plants has a function. There's tomatoes there. Underneath all my tomatoes last year, I planted tansies, um, which were fantastic. They are so strong and, and so beneficial. I had no aphid problems ever. I will be doing that again every year. The calendula went in. I can't even see. I've got mixed croppings of courgettes and sturgeons. There's apps. It's, it's, it, I mean, it's utter chaos. <laughs> I'm not suggesting that yours is as chaotic as mine. But it shows it's more like a jungle than it is like a monoculture. And I had no pest problems in there whatsoever. So just experiment um, and plant use your borders. Um, that was a whistle stop tour. Jill, it's 12.48, so please don't feel like you have to stay, guys. Um, but if you want to stay, and if you've got any questions, then I guess um, just pop them in the chat and Jill and I will cover them, is that fair? We'll be back again next week. Am I uh, am I still on show here? Yeah, I can yeah. still hear you. Yeah, I'm just getting there. Uh, I'm getting uh, a lot of feedback about being unstable at the moment. <laughs> um, can you put seeds straight into ground in a polytunnel? Yes, you can. Um, you can direct so things like carrots, for example, things like parsnips, uh, things like radish. Uh, there's a good one to plant together, actually, radish and uh, parsnip is a great one. The radish comes through a lot, lot faster than the parsnip. Um, so it's what's called a sort of indicator plant. So by the time you actually get your radishes through and harvested, your parsnips are just coming through and they'll indicate where your parsnips are sown next to them. So um, that's a good one. So, yeah, you can. What's good next to courgettes? Sharon, what did you plant underneath your tomatoes? I had courgettes, actually. I had courgettes bordering it. Um, so courgettes certainly were. I'm just having a look online to see what it says because I don't like to do the do. do. Um, Practising sending a message. Elizabeth, loud and clear, we've got you. <laughs> <laughs> Do you plant broad beans in the ground outside or in seed trays? Now, um, I'm not sure. I haven't. Um, right. Okay, shut up, Jill. I'll tell you what I do. And then Sharon can come in with the benefit of her experience. Um, what I do is I plant my broad beans um, and any of my beans and my pea plants, I plant them in modules. So those little square trays with the cells in them. Um, and I'll plant them in there first and I grow them in the modules. And then once, <coughs> sorry, excuse me, once we're past the risk of frost, um, I'll put them out. But I will let them grow quite big in those modules for the simple reason that if you put out something that's that size, your pigeons and your birds and everything else in your garden that likes to eat seedlings is going to absolutely take them to bits. So you'll end up with little green stubs, root, nothing left up top. If you put out a plant that's that size, then if they do damage some of the leaves, the most important bit is the growing tips on them um, may, may still survive and they're much stronger and much more resilient to the birds and the pests. So that, that to me, I found it was, is better than putting out things that are this size. You're much better... To Thanks everyone. You, for go, saying, you got anything to add? No, I, I would I would probably do the same, especially if you just sort of started out. Um, I would encourage people, you know, we're talking about seed packs actually, rather than planting all your again, or don't plant all your broad beans at one plant, do a successional sowings. So sow 10 this week and then sow 10 next week and 10 the week after it, because if you do find not all your eggs are in one basket. So you can definitely direct the sows, but yeah, they are more prone to get taken by mice and things like that. Um, I just they don't checked. need covered. No. Sorry, just sorry, Sharon. Somebody's popped a question on there about do they need covered? Broad oh. beans don't need covered. No. Um, the uh, I just had a quick check. The companions for um, courgettes, I think it was sweet corn, cucumbers, squash, um, borage, beans, peas, so your legumes, marigolds, and sturgeons. Absolutely, loads of things that you can companion. Um, I still don't always know. There's some of my always go-tos, like a lot of my beds have got garlic around it and onions and things like that, because I know that they're really strong companions, but I still tend to check everything. So yeah, a quick 
a quick Google search on one of the charts just to give you the list. I think I've dropped. Oh, sorry, I'm dropping out again. I missed that. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, Fiona was asking a oh. question about uh, Robson fruit trees. Recommend how to go about designing a space. Watch this space next week, <laughs> Fiona, because we're going to do a little bit on <laughs> design, design and layout next week. So Sharon will have loads of ideas for you for that for next week. Yeah, we've got um, uh, about a 20 minute talk on site design and choices next week. So coming at it that we understand most people are sort of starting out and beginning. So we'll be looking at that um, and trying to give you some hints and tips on how to design your gardens, some basic do's and don'ts. Yes, you can plant beans and peas inside a calf plastic bottle to prove that's absolutely true. Yeah, Karen, that's a very good point. Um, mm -hmm. And I'll try and get a picture up actually, I have got yep. a picture because we actually talked about that last week, didn't we? Um, maybe you could start just now um but just bear in mind we are not uh, first of all i don't know where you are in the country fiona but just bear in mind that we are not frost free until at least the beginning of um may um so sometimes if you start things early and this was a lesson again that i learned from sharon was if you start things early um they they tend to grow and the bee, they become quite tall and leggy because they're striving to reach the light because the light levels aren't quite there at this time of year yet. And then if you waited a month and planted the same thing again, you would very often find that actually the second lot that you planted later do better than your first lot. Um, just because the light levels are there, just because the conditions are, are better for them, the soil's a bit warmer, all of these things can affect it. So yeah, we are absolutely desperate to get going. If you've got a propagator, then I do have some stuff going in the propagator just now, but I've got no intention of putting any of that stuff out. And um, if you don't have that, then sometimes it's not worth starting things early, um, even though you might be desperate. But <laughs> and that was a mistake that I made at the start as well, and one which I've learned from Sharon. Oh, that answers your question. Yeah. yeah. It's very hard to be patient in Scotland, especially if you're anything like me, I've got about that much patience. That's on a good day. But yeah, but the gardening will teach you to be patient. So there's there's, there's a few people dropped out. We're still um, unbelievably 27 participants, so we're going to head off shortly. <laughs> um We've got we've got time built into sessions as well to do questions so hopefully if people find that useful and interesting thanks ever so much everyone for getting up on the chat Thank and you. doing your breakout rooms that was cracking we really appreciate you all thanks tessa lovely comments everybody thank you